listens to us anymore. Uh, I want to begin with a big shout out to Tom in Riverside Hospital in uh, Columbus, Ohio. His sister is along with us on this journey, Karen Liu. And Karen Liu says, prayers and love to you. Moreover, Carol Livingston and all the Catholics of Tucson and all the Newman churches are praying for uh, Brother Tom. Karen Liu's organized this amazing prayer, prayer network for you, Tom. And she is your best cheerleader in the world, as your brother-in-law is as well. And, and the good doctor and Karen Liu are just cheering you on. We're thinking about you, and I'm going to keep progress uh, reports on you. Also, this is the week of the draft, and, and so Tom in the hospital will be able to watch the Browns draft. If he didn't get to go home tomorrow, he, he gets to go watch the Browns draft from the hospital. Browns are drafting 44, 78, and 99. I'm not sure, Ed, if they can do this without me. What do you think? I, I've never been out of the country before for the draft. Well, as long as I've watched the Cleveland Browns, I can tell you this, Hugh, they can't do it with you either, so I don't know. I'd... <laughs> oh, that's not true. We also have an audience today. <laughs> Uh, the lovely Mrs. Radio Blogger is with us, as well as George, longtime Tribble, who's been drinking all night. And so George is, oh, oh, I see. And, and Radio Blogger is here because he's going to wear a beret during the show. And uh, we, we, we'll have to show that to you in a little bit. Let's do the rundown for those of you dependent upon the news. I mentioned the French President Emmanuel Macron won 48, uh, 58 to 42. It wasn't close. We never thought it was close. I got to tell you, Ed. I've been in Paris, in, in France for a week now. Not one sign, not one discussion other than the debate that I tuned in on on middle of last week. And it was the only time you're gonna have to turn the you're gonna have to turn the camera on you at some point. Are you surprised at all by the blowout, Edward? No. No, I wasn't surprised. And and you and I discussed this last week, and both of us were saying, look, this is not going to be close. It, it might be closer than it was the first time around, but that was a pretty historic blowout the last time around. 16-point win is is right in the range of kind of where I thought it was. Right in the middle of a crisis, uh, Macron is handling the Ukraine crisis pretty well. I think that now that uh, the, the, the Russia is kind of showing its true colors, the idea of getting out of NATO, if you're in Europe, the idea of getting out of NATO is ridiculous. The whole thing now is getting into NATO. Yeah, the, the funniest part about this was there was an attempt to generate some interest in this election by pretending that maybe all those left-wing voters whose candidate didn't make it in will, will jump over Macron and go vote for Le Pen. That was, this, this has had about as much drama as a radio show has about whether or not we can get on the air. I suppose we not be able to get on the air, but it's highly, highly unlikely that we aren't going to get on the air. Washington Post, in a war marked by Russia's underperformance, by its inability to take Kiev, its failed attempt to decapitate Ukrainian leadership, control of the devastated Mar metropolis of Mar Mariupol amounts to horrific Kremlin victory. Moreover, Lloyd Austin, Secretary Blinken were in Kiev yesterday. Lloyd Austin said we want to undermine the Russians. He said some other stuff, but undermine the Russians, the only thing that the people of Russia are going to see, Edward. This, you did a post over at hotair.com, which I would encourage everyone to read as to why this was not a smart move. Yeah, it's it, the it plays right into what Vladimir Putin is telling his own people that this is a this is a global war against Russia trying to kneecap Russia he's fighting for uh, Russia's proper place in the world etc cetera, etc cetera. so when you when you have the secretary of defense saying we want to weaken Russia to the degree that they can't do this anymore all Russians are going to hear is we want to weaken Russia and that's all Putin's going to allow them to hear it really plays into this and i think that this is uh, American policymakers calculating their messages for the domestic American audience for their own political benefit when they should be thinking about how to frame this. We're, we're missing the Cold War element, right? The Cold War uh, uh, element where we said we love the Russian people, we just think the Soviet system is bad, it's this you know, evil empire, but the Russian people are good and we, we know that they want something better for themselves. We're missing that element here. In 2004, then Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld came on the show and stunned me by saying he didn't have enough time to focus on the social media impact of the war. It was new then, right? There wasn't even Twitter then, but he did not care that troops were blogging from the front. Uh, this is, you know, they, I don't know if Facebook was around, but there was social media and there were chat rooms and there were things that have now come and gone, the, the old Microsoft thing, the, the very first one that was run by somebody. There were lots of social media platforms that were run elsewhere. And he said, I, I'm working too hard to care about social media. And I thought, that means you're, that's like not paying attention to a front in the war. And I wonder if this is, and this is your question, Ed, is this a generational gap? Lloyd Austin is older than you and I, and he's a fine general, and people said that. But I wonder if he spends a lick of time on social media. I wonder if he knows what the Russians can do with a five-second clip, we want to undermine Russia. 
Well, I don't even think that that's a social media issue. I think that's just a propaganda issue. And it's a very similar to the propaganda issues we had during the Cold War. <clears throat> you can even make the, um, you can even make the uh, argument that it's very similar to propaganda issues that we had during, the, during World War II. I mean, there are just certain things that you say that you know are going to get translated um, if it helps out the dictator that you're trying to fight against. So this is, to me, it's not even a social media issue. This is just a media media issue. It's a it's a it's a message management issue, and they're not terribly good at it in the Biden administration. No, they're ter- and every Russian TV outlet will have that today. Just that part. We wish to undermine Russia. That's it. Uh, from the Financial Times, two story. Vladimir Putin has lost interest in diplomatic efforts to end his war with Ukraine, and. Uh, from China, local authorities in Shanghai fenced off apartment building entrances to further restrict residents' movements in the city. The tough new tactics in Shanghai came as COVID cases in Beijing, not Shanghai, Beijing, jumped to 22 over the weekend, forcing authorities in the Chinese capital to lock down communities hit by the virus. Bottom line, the Chinese vaccine was crap, didn't work. And yep. so all of Shanghai is locked down. They're close to rebellion. They're, they're starving to death. Now it's moving to Beijing, and those crappy virus uh, didn't work. And there's another story that one of the leaders of China is on the board of one of the pharmaceutical companies that sold a bozo remedy. It, all the corrupt leadership of China is now dealing with all their corrupt decisions. And I really wonder, I asked a couple of, of smart people on this cruise, uh, and, and I, I might even ask George since he's in the room, do you think they might have gone a bridge too far in China, Edward, and that they might have revolutionary? You know, the French Revolution came because 90% of the people were paying 90% of their income in bread. They couldn't feed themselves. And that's what's happening in Shanghai of 25 million and soon in Beijing. You think there's any chance this becomes a pivot moment? Absolutely. Could very well be a destabilizing uh, moment in, in, in China's history for the exact same reason. I mean, the, the, uh, even dictatorships have to still feed the people. And if they don't feed the people, they collapse. And I mean, the, the, this is the whole thing about COVID-19 and you hit the nail on the head here, is that their vaccines didn't work. We saw this in Chile, we saw it in the UAE, we saw it in other countries where we could rely, we could rely on the data. China kept saying, oh, it's working, it's working. If their vaccines were working, they wouldn't be trying to do the full lockdown right now. And it's a disaster. What they really need is they need to start importing American-made vaccines and European-made vaccines. They'll never do it, and so they have really landed themselves in a in a in a lockbox. They are they don't have a way out of this. I think the best that they can hope for is that they can sort of let it go for a month or so and hopefully start reopening. I don't know how many people are going to die. It's very it. dangerous for the world because the Shanghai economy shuttered, the Chinese economy is shuttered. It's already fragile. It's very dangerous for markets everywhere. Today at the Supreme Court. The arguments will be held in the question of a high school football coach who knelt at halftime at at the end of a game at the 50-yard marker uh, and was fired. And he has an op-ed in the journal. The uh, journal has an uh, editorial page. I think this is one of the most interesting court cases. You know, if I were the parents of a child who was not a believer and the football coach was not a Catholic or a Protestant, and they went to half time, and they went to the 50 yard marker after every game and there was an expectation that you would do of course i would argue you can't do that uh what he w- but on the other hand he no one had to go and i have to trust his testimony that no one and i doubt anyone was ever not included the plaintiff is the parent of a, a child proclaimed to be an atheist who felt pressured to go pray at halftime how do you think this turns out edward I, you know, the Supreme Court, this is the second time the Supreme Court's had this. They kind of kicked it back to for, for further deliberations. I, I'm I'm suspecting that they'd like to kick it back again if they possibly can, but I think that I think they're stuck with this. And I and I think that what it's gonna come down to is the coach's First Amendment right to pray wherever he wants to pray. And uh, I, I to me, I, I suspect that this coach is gonna end up on the winning side of this, and that's gonna have some interesting implications. Uh, down the road for other issues in, in in terms of school speech. Yeah, it is not a religious freedom restoration act issue. It's a for, it's a first amendment, fourteenth amendment it's issue, right. and they are interfering. Can you can you turn that and show them what you are looking like, radio blogger? If you happen to be watching on the uh, on the show right now, I you look still like, can't. I look like Curtis Sliwa. Actually, they can't see you. Yeah. I, Oh, you're up there. Now they can. It was delayed. Right there. Curtis Sliwa is co hosting with me today. Yes, I think so. The guardian angel of the Hugh Hewitt show (laughs) is in beret clad Dwayne. 
Tom, listen to the whole show. Everyone keep praying for Tom. Edward, we'll be right back after the break here on the French edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt from On the Sane. I am along with radio blogger Ed Morrissey is uh, along with me from Texas in the event that the Internet collapses in France as they celebrated last night if you were a Macron voter. Joined by Selena Zito with the weekly Yinzer Report on Monday. Selena, I read your column on Nikki Haley in the D.C. Examiner. It's very interesting. We have some... Uh, Minnesota cold people on the on the ship with us, and they are going to be hosting Nikki Haley in an event in Minnesota cold in a couple of weeks. And they want me to you know give my assessment of Nikki Haley, and I did, which is she's very talented and, and seriously running for president. President Trump doesn't, but you illuminated me in your column. She's out there working for everybody. Yeah. So we, good morning. Thanks for having me on. So yeah, I mean she's out there doing the thing that if you're if you have plans on running for president and you aren't holding office um, or you don't hold office she's doing the things that you need to do to not only win uh, you know uh, develop a relationship with conservatives across the country those are that those kinds of relationships are incredibly important in it um, especially in primary caucuses in, in two years um, but also showing that she can help bring people over the line in top races. Selena, this is Ed. Great talking with you again. Um, I, I read this Good piece morning. and you were talking. Good morning. Uh, and you, <laughs> I, I read the piece at, uh, about Nikki Haley. Great article um, in the Washington Examiner. Everybody should be reading this. Uh, you talk about Nikki Haley's um, work to sort of uh, redefine conservatism or try to bring conservative ba conservatism back to a uh, 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 a more familiar territory is this uh, is this sort of a reaction to uh, what she might be looking at as an overdose of populism what is it exactly that Nikki Haley wants to do with conservatism oh no I, I think she very much considers herself an econo economic and cultural populist I think okay. um, that she I think she just wants to you know bring you know I mean you win elections by coalitions right and part of the strength of the coalition in 2010, 2009, 2014, were the economic populists that were part of the Tea Party. They became part of a conservative populism that helped bring Donald Trump in in 2016, but also were very instrumental in, despite Donald Trump losing in 2020, down ballot, Republicans continue to have robust turnout, robust um, and, uh, elections of conservatives in state and local elections, and you saw it again in, in 2021 with Glenn Youngkin, also almost in New Jersey, but also again in municipal and row offices across the country. Those elections are incredibly important, but bringing these people together um, is, I think, she believes is an important part of of, of growing this coalition. So, Selena, give us an update on the Pennsylvania Senate election. I know that um, Fetterman, the liberal Democrat lunatic, uh, uh, won the debate handily, though both of the others who are far behind him uh, just jammed him for opening, not op for pointing a weapon at, a, at an unarmed African-American man who he thought was a danger to his son, and they hammered him on that. I still think he's going to win. Who, uh, Mike Pompeo endorsed David McCormick last week. What's the situation? When does the vote occur in Pennsylvania? Okay, so the election is May 17th. Um, Fetterman is going to win probably quite handily. He's run a good campaign in terms of getting out there and doing good retail politics. Almost nobody watches a debate in, in, a, in a Senate race, uh, except maybe if there's some clips of some real doozies. So I think that um, any contention that Lamb or Kenyatta have on that elect on that debate that they wanted because of bringing up the um, uh, the um, the gun um, um, by Fetterman is is not going to have an impact. Um, David McCormick uh, had been you know winning quite handily in the primary uh, that stalled but did not stop in uh, when Trump endorsed. Um, Dr. Oz, uh, which was a shock to just about every conservative in the state. Uh, Oz got a bit of a bump, but that is now faded. I think that Oz has a ceiling, and he's hit his ceiling, 
and McCormick will win this. Selena, the city of Philadelphia tried to reimpose a mask mandate and ended up having to uh, withdraw from it uh, four days later. Does Do you think that that's going to impact how people vote uh, in the midterm election in, in Pennsylvania, that, that, that little false move back to mandates? Well, sure. I mean, I think that the Wolf administration, that's our governor here, is wildly, wildly both <laughs> unpopular. Um, a mandate such as the mask is going to have an impact, but the biggest impact um, coming out of Philadelphia is going to be the insane crime wave that's going on there. I, mean, I think there were there were over 30 people uh, or 55 people shot over Easter weekend alone. So it's just that's going to be have a big big impact. That and inflation. Wow. I didn't know that. I will uh, I will start reading the Inquirer just to find out what the bullet count is. Selena Zito, always a pleasure. Read everything at selenazito.com. Come right back, hour number two, with Ed Morrissey co-hosting. I'm in France. Ed is in Texas, so we've got everything covered. The tree color and the Texas Republic all in here for you. And Jake Sherman opens up with news from the House Republican Conference when we return to the Hugh Hewitt Show, France edition. Bonjour, hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt, hour number two of the second week in France of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Ed Morrissey standing by with me in Texas in the event that France goes to bed or goes on vacation early this year after the presidential election that saw Macron win. Jake Sherman joins us from Washington, D.C. His Punchbowl News newsletter this morning, which you could have already received if you subscribe for free at punchbowlnews.com, lets us know that Patrick McHenry is, no, McHenry is no longer Congressman Extraordinaire from North Carolina, interested in the House leadership. He's going to take over financial services. Uh, good scoop for you, Jake. Good morning. How are you? Good Monday to you. You're on with Ed Morrissey and me, Hugh Hewitt. Hey, Hugh. How are you guys? Great, great, great. So where did you get that scoop from, Mr. McHenry himself? I would never reveal my sources, but um, obviously we're, we're confident in the reporting. Uh this is a big this is a big deal, Hugh, as you correctly noted. Uh, McHenry was the favorite for GOP whip, and um, McCarthy, Kevin McCarthy, and Steve Scalise, who are expected to ascend as the number one and two in leadership if Republicans take the majority, which everybody kind of believes they will, um, they're going to need a strong whip. And McHenry was seen, and and my experience in covering him for the past twelve or so years is that he would be a uh, a very good whip. He was the chief deputy whip under Steve Scalise in the last Republican majority, but ultimately he decided to stay at financial services, which is a, a also a pretty big job. I mean, he will be chairman of a committee, uh, presumably if Republicans take the majority, that has huge influence on everything from, you know, the new frontier of digital payments to Wall Street to everything in between. And uh, as we note in the, in the newsletter this morning, um, there is a, uh, a history of people who have... Uh, deep committee experiences becoming speaker at some point. Nancy Pelosi, Paul Ryan, and John Boehner are the three notable examples, the last three uh, speakers of the House. So uh, I wouldn't count McHenry out for something in the future. So Patrick McHenry is going to take over financial services. For the benefit of the Steelers fans, there are three committees in Congress of which you can be a member only of that committee, Ways and Means of Probes and Financial Services. And my, my longtime friend, John Campbell, who is a uh, guest hosted for me many years and is often on the after show with Dwayne, was on financial services for a long time and explained to me, and Jake, you might want to expand on that, that eat, raising money on financial services like mowing the grass. You can go out and have a fundraiser, and then you have to go have another fundraiser the next week, and then you have another fundraiser the next week, and you'll, you will take away bags of gold every time. Why is that, Jake? Well, uh, uh, obviously, the financial services sector has a lot of money, and people in the financial services sector have a lot of money, and that's right. You could raise a lot of money. This is a, a committee that, um, yes, there are, there's the fundraising is huge, and and quite frankly, um, there is a just there's just a ton of legislation going through this committee on on every front. And yes, that is a dirty secret that you can raise a ton of money on it. It's also I mean, let's be clear, it is a, a very heavy policy committee, policy that McHenry um, enjoys and, and has, by the way, has a good relationship with Democrats on the committee, including Maxine Waters, who is the chairman right now. Uh, and I don't know whether she's going to be the ranking member of if Republicans win the majority, but I would assume she would be. Jake, uh, this let's talk a little bit about the whip job, because depending on yeah. how the how this turns out, right, um, how this election turns out, 
that might be a really difficult job. I mean, I can't imagine that it's a great job right now with a nine seat majority for Nancy Pelosi. And if the election turns out to be a little narrower, uh, Kevin McCarthy has maybe 20, 25 uh, seats uh, on, in the margin there. The whip job might be a little difficult, especially given some of the fractiousness of the, the various ideological uh, caucuses there. Who is, who's running for this now that McHenry is out? And is this something that is maybe there might be a couple of candidates who are thinking twice about this as well? Yeah, so a few, a few thoughts there. Number one, if McCarthy has a 20-seat margin, the whip job will be quite easy. Uh, well, it'll be a little easier, yeah. Yeah, he could lose a ton of seats, with, a ton of votes without losing votes on the floor. Yes, it's going to be a very difficult job. And as we pointed out this morning, there are basically two things that need to get done in the next Congress, uh, a government funding bill and a, um, a debt ceiling bill, both of which are going to be extraordinarily difficult uh, list for the GOP leadership and will require a strong whip. Now, another thought here is McCarthy and Scalise, if they are speaker and majority leader, will be uh, doing a lot of whipping on their own. Um, but you still need a strong operation. Now, um, the, the race is, I mean, I would say the front runner, should she decide to, to run, is Elise Stefanik of New York, who's the number four. Uh, uh, three in the in the leadership right now in the minority leadership, uh, but this would be a new job for Stefanik, and it would require her to run a pretty competitive race because she's not going to be in it alone. Uh, running against her will almost certainly be Tom Emmer, the NRCC chair, Jim Banks of Indiana, uh, a top conservative who runs the Republican Study Committee, uh, Drew Ferguson, who's currently the chief deputy whip. But listen, I think Republicans realize, and they have for years, that they need a woman in their leadership. And she would be, if my memory, if I, I, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but the first female whip in the, for Republicans ever. Um, I, would, I think that's almost definitely true. Um, and listen, she has a strong base of support in the conference. And, um, and she, the question is, could she put, will she put together a race? She's, this, she's indicated she wants to be the chair of the Education and Labor Committee. But the whip job is pretty tough to turn up, and that's, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised McHenry even turned it up, because I thought his entire career had kind of been building to this moment. But I imagine that Stefanik will get in, and she will be the uh, immediate front runner. You know, Jake, my assessment of why uh, the congressman did that is that the age difference between McCarthy and Scalise and McHenry is not so great. It is great between Stefanik. She can take a long time to ascend and wait for a generation to pass on, but McHenry is pretty much locked in a race with the other two forever. So if you go to financial services, you will get a great job after Congress. You will pass significant legislation one way or the other. You will be energized. She can afford to wait. Uh, Jim Banks, a good friend of mine. I know Tom Emmer is a little bit. They're both good members. I think it'll be one of those two, and I would give Banks, as chair of the Republican Study Committee, uh, a slight edge because he doesn't have to say no to anybody. Emmer's has to say no to a lot of people when it comes to money at the last minute. Let me go, though, to the buried lead in this morning's Punchbowl News, and it's a buried lead. 107 members on the conference committee of USICA. Now, would you tell people what USICA is? I have never heard of a conference committee having 107 members. They're going to need a conference committee for the conference committee, Jake. What happened there? Yeah, so uh, USICA is the big bill. We've talked about it a bunch of you on this show. Uh, it is a big bill that's designed to combat the technological rise of China. It is a, a product that came out of the Senate with a very wide bipartisan majority, kind of captained by Todd Young, John Cornyn, Chuck Schumer, and others on the Senate side. It kind of ran into a little bit of resistance in the House where Nancy Pelosi passed her own partisan bill, and now they have to go into a formal negotiation between the two chambers. The Senate has the leg up here because it's unified while the House is split between Republicans and Democrats on what they want on this legislation. I would say, though, uh, it is a large conference committee. It's going to be, I would imagine, handled by a few, a few people, not the entire committee. Um, but what happened is this bill has a lot of jurisdiction. Committees have a lot of jur jurisdiction over this bill, a wide range of committees, including everyone from Foreign Affairs to the uh, uh, Commerce Committee on the Senate side, Energy and Commerce on the, Repu on the House side, uh, uh, Science, Space, and Technology on the House side. It's just a lot of people who want a seat at the table and who, frankly, deserve a seat at the table. 
So I would I would guess. Listen, I would say this is the best chance for a large bipartisan agreement before the Congress is over at the end of this year. But it's still going to be a very heavy lift. The Biden administration badly wants this bill. It would boost semiconductor and chip manufacturing in the United States by a ton, by a, a good amount, and invest heavily in the high-tech sector in the U.S. It's amazing, Hugh. I know you and I have talked about this before, but we have no semiconductors made in this country, and, and uh, we're very heavily reliant on Asia to make semiconductors, and that's not something that's sustainable, according to people in both parties and experts. So I, I, this is a, a big chance for a big bipartisan agreement. So, Jake, what's the timeline on this? I mean, it looks like it's pretty well laid out. The, the Punchbowl News report is really good on all the details. What's the timeline on this? I would say the next couple months. I mean, there's a hope that they will be able to get this done before the Memorial Day break. I am skeptical, as uh, somebody in the White House always puts it to me, someone in this White House, when it comes to Congress, always bet the over. <laughs> it always takes longer than you would anticipate. To come to an agreement and to squeeze it through both chambers is very difficult. It takes precious floor time. It's just there's a lot going on. But, and also I would say, and this is something else we might want to address in the show, but there's going to be a push for more money for Ukraine, more COVID money. Um, if you'll remember, that the, the COVID part got uh, uh, canceled at the end of the Congress. There's a lot going on. We will be back. Jake Sherman of PunchbowlNews.com. Thank you. If you want to be as smart as Ed and I are about you seek and everything else, go subscribe to Punchbowl News. Come right back. Show from the River Seine. I am joined by Ari Fleischer along with my co-host Ed Morrissey, who is standing by in Texas and will participate in the conversation with Ari in the event that France decides to shutter our internet like Twitter shutters Hunter Biden stories. Ari Fleischer has got a new book coming out. Suppression, deception, snobbery, and bias. For some reason, snobbery's got this really cool cover addition to it. And of course, suppression, deception, and snobbery and bias is not out yet. But we brought Kurt, we brought Ari on early to find out when it comes out, what it's about, and how we promote suppression, deception, snobbery, and bias more than by saying suppression, depression, snobbery, and deception, snobbery, and bias. You know, Ari, this thing, Lentz tells us we got to say the title seven times. I don't think I can say suppression, deception, snobbery, and bias seven times. Yeah, it's a tongue twister. Uh, the second part it is. Though, everybody will remember, and, and that's why the press gets so much wrong and just doesn't care. And, and you know, Hugh, I, I wrote the book because I was fed up. It, it'll come out in July, but I was fed up watching the coverage of Donald Trump. Now, I think Donald Trump can be criticized. I've criticized him sometimes. I've praised him sometimes. But the press went into hyperdrive thinking that he was a threat to the country and that it was their job, their role, to tell the country what to do. And they lost the trust of the American people. They'd already been losing the trust of the American people for decades because they were liberal. But they crossed the line, became activists for a cause, and the cause was to get Trump. And they totally, totally diverted the news and ruined the industry as a result of their activism. Ruin the industry is an interesting, provocative assessment. Uh, I'm going to give Ed Morrissey a question while I get ready to play some Brian Stelter for you. Uh, Ed, go ahead. Take Ari for a second while I get this ready. <laughs> Ari, thanks for joining us. Hey, look, I just talked to Bernard Goldberg uh, just maybe about a week ago or so, You know, author of the seminal book, Bias. And in that book, he argued at the time that uh, editorial bias was not – uh, deliberate. It was just baked in because the viewpoints of so many editors were just informed by by liberal groupthink. I speaking to him last week. He is. He says that, that was true then, but now it's a deliberate choice to manipulate news for a particular um, uh, political viewpoint. Is that what you see as well, Ari? One hundred percent. Look, I, I started as a press secretary on Capitol Hill in the eighties, and everybody knew that the press corps was liberal. They tried to be objective. It was part of their mission to be objective, and they, they, they were dedicated to it. That has faded out in a way, and it really took Donald Trump to do it. Donald Trump kicked off every worst instinct in the media, and they did it to themselves. And they did it because they made the conscious decision that he was such a threat that it was incumbent on them to deceive the American people by putting stories on the air that were false and to suppress news that made Donald Trump look good. And as an objective, fair-minded person myself, I could not sit by and let them do this without blowing the whistle on them. Look, one of the things in my first chapter, my first chapter is called Original Sin, and it points out who goes into journalism in the first place. 
And it is overwhelmingly people cut from the same cloth, college-educated, mostly Democratic voters who are out of touch, out of touch with people who own guns, out of touch with people who are pro-life, out of touch with people from rural areas. But it's worse than out of touch. They're snobs about it. They look down on people. And one of the things that I use in my first chapter is an interview that Hugh Hewitt did with Joan Co- Jane Cos- Coaston of the New York Times, where he said, oh, yes. her, remember this? You, you said you played a game with yes. her. The 5,000 most important people in journalism, you asked her. How many voted for Trump? She said 2%. You said, how many for Romney? She said 7%. How many for McCain? 4%. You asked her, how many are pro-life? And, you know, across the board, she blew the whistle on her colleagues by acknowledging just how far to the left they are. And this is journalism's original sin. And you marry that. You know, Ari, I, I did the same thing with uh, I, I did the same thing with Tom Edsel long before Trump. Uh-huh. And Tom, you know, Tom's just Tom. He doesn't give a crap what anyone knows or doesn't know. He said, oh, 95 percent of the people in newsrooms voted for uh, uh, John Kerry. I think it was John Kerry. Ari, I got to play for you something I played for Ed because I need your reaction to Brian Stelter. Poor guy is in this unwinnable. Se- I like Brian. I've done, you know, when I, I've gone up the Acela with Brian, I like Brian. Done his show back in the old days, and you know he's he's a lefty and he's way left, and his show is biased, and we all know it's kind of a funny thing. It's it's like watching the Browns, right? We're not going to win with 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 uh, with Brian. <laughs> Here's how he explained CNN Plus yesterday. Here at CNN, new ownership decided to shut down the CNN Plus streaming service less than a month after it was launched by the previous management team. The U-turn was front page news, stunning news, and painful news for everyone involved. Years of development possibly down the drain. Some of the shows may never be seen. Hundreds of staffers may be laid off, though the company is trying to place many of them in new jobs. Amid these bruising headlines, folks are trying to make sense of it, and some partisans are leaping to predictable talking points about politics. But the truth is, this was a corporate move. This CNN Plus service was doomed because of the timing of a merger and clashing streaming strategies. The new owner of CNN, Warner Brothers Discovery, has big plans to combine multiple streaming platforms to make one big challenger for Netflix. All right, so Ari, what's your take on Brian's take? Flashing streaming strategies? I mean, you talk about <laughs> the, the reason, and it's yes, so simple, is because nobody wants to watch CNN. This, this is their problem. <laughs> you, you know, I, uh, I actually have a chapter in the book dedicated to CNN and another chapter dedicated to the New York Times, and I, I trace the downfall of each. And the problem with CNN is they, more than any other journalistic institution, from the top down decided that their mission was to editorialize the news and get Trump. And in so doing, they led the league in retractions. They had more retractions on CNN of blockbuster stories that they then had to take back because they were just airing anything that crossed their threshold that would make Trump look bad. And CNN wants to have it both ways. They want to be seen as a journalistic outlet while acting like MSNBC warriors. And this is why they're now a man without a country and they're a streaming service without any viewers. Well, I had, a, I had a different take, which Ed has heard. I want to hear your take on my take and then let Ed give you your take. My take on CNN Plus Collapse is that it's too slow. And all, all television news is too slow. You, do, you can't do the news on TV because it's too slow. I run down between 10 and 15 stories in the first segment of every show every morning, drawn from six or seven uh, newspapers of, of reputation and reach, and I jam it into 11 minutes and people download my podcast, uh, Highly Concentrated Hugh, for that. Ari, you just can't make television news very interesting for the people who would who are news junkies. They might want to have confirmation bias. They might get that, but you can't make it fast enough. Yeah, the difference there, though, is Fox can. Fox has millions of viewers, while CNN and MSNBC don't. And it's not just ideological viewers. Uh, so there is still a visual medium that people are drawn to. They want to see the picture. It helps drive it home. CNN's problem really did fall down to their ideological leanings were inconsistent with telling the story straight and giving people news. You know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I boil it down even simpler than that, Ari. I, I, it goes back to what our, our, our grandmothers used to say. Why buy the milk? Why buy the cow when you're getting the milk for free? I mean, honestly, I, there's nothing on CNN Plus that's that really adds to your daily life. And, and it would be true yeah. really for almost any news organization. Um, 
if you're if you're online in any sense and you're already supplying the actual news, nobody's going to pay for the softer side of CNN or the New York Times or the Washington Post uh, with a with a further subscription. It's just a dumb business model, and I think it was a vanity project. Right, the host is just. A- the host has just had a great idea that I want to put out there. Uh, it's a great idea. I haven't thought it through. I haven't articulated it. It's a great idea. I think the first presidential debate in the 2024 cycle should be moderated by Ari Fleischer and Jen Psaki. And I am dead serious. What do you think, Ari? You both would know how to gig the other team, right? And you both would be within the bounds of fairness. It, it, it would be fun, but I don't want to see Jen cry on national TV. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but, me but, you, but you need to have a yeah. You've got to have a skill set. You got to be able to move fast. You got to know the issues. You got to be credible. Both of you have been in the podium, so you know how to to frame questions. Ed, what do you think of my brilliant idea? Uh, it's, well, it's brilliant, Hugh. It's not well thought out, but it's brilliant. I mean, I, I, I I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Is this pay-per-view? Because it sounds like there'd be more of a debate between Ari and Jen than there would be. I'm not sure that the, the presidential candidates would, would be able to would be able to get a word in edgewise. I think Ari and Jen. Oh would, no, no, I, they, they would be I, fair. They, they would be fair. See, hey, Brian, uh, Ari, let's go Jen back to Saki. some. I, uh, can, let me speak to yes. Saki. I want to make a point. I referenced her lot, her crying, and that was in regard to the Florida law, which, as we all know. DeSantis signed it. It bans the teaching about sexual orientation among kids grades K through 3. Jen was told the law is don't say gay, because that's how the New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, and liberal outlets describe it. One of the cases I make in my book is that one of the groups in America hurt the most by the news industry are liberals, because the mainstream media has become one of the greatest sources of misinformation for the American people. So Jen hears, don't say gay, and she cries because she earnestly believes that good people, teenagers struggling to identify their orientation, are being hurt, and the struggle is made worse. Instead of being told, no, this means that teachers in K-3 through can't talk about sexual orientation to little kids. This is the problem when the media deceives the American people and suppresses what the news is. It's not just conservatives who get hurt. It's good-minded liberals who take it for the truth. And so there. Let me bring. Up, I'll let. I'll add to that, Ari. All these stories that since my book came out, the press continues to do it. They deceive the American people, and they suppress the truth. Ari, right, but the book's not out yet. They can pre-order suppression, Correct. deception, yep. snobbery, right? But they can pre-order it. That, but they, you have to come back and do a whole thing when I've had yep. a chance to read it. Uh, I got a note from a good friend of mine who said, "I see that your right-wing Republican Party wants to bring back the anti-sodomy laws." And I thought to myself, this is going to be a shock to Rick Grinnell and, and Guy Benson and every other gay Republican I know that, that, that there's some... Re- Do you know of any Republican anywhere who wants to bring back those laws? Any single Good one. Good God. No, this is the point. You, you, you picked right up on it. And, you know, for 10 years now, at least 10 years, there are so many stories that I will look at and I'll just flip right over. Usually they're based on an anonymous source who has an agenda. Or they are just such a distortion that you know they can't be true. The Georgia voting law is another example. When the Georgia voting law beat Republicans up for saying you can't give food or water to people waiting in line, and aren't Republicans cruel for wanting to make people uh, die of thirst on the line to vote? You know, I just knew that's so over the top, there's got to be more to it. So I looked into it, and of course the law is that you can have a table set up 10 yards away, less than a first down in football, and... Somebody can walk out of the line, get the water, get back into the line, but the law is designed to protect people from having others approach them on the line wearing a MAGA hat or a pro-choice hat or a pro-life hat where people would cry voter intimidation. All it's right. perfect. Ari, I would cry because that means if it's if it's 10 yards away, Terry, uh, I, uh, Ben Roethlisberger could never get anything to eat if it's 10 yards away. Ari right, Fleischer, thank you. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back with Ed Moore. America tomorrow. Kurt Schlichter will be in for me. I'll be back on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from France. Generalissimo and I want again shout out Brother Tom, your sister Karen Lewis just got you in her prayers, as do our friends Carol Livingston and all of Tucson. Hang in there, buddy. I'm joined by Ed Morrissey in Texas and by, of course, Hotline Josh, Josh Kraschauer, political reporter extraordinaire. Josh, uh, I'm in France. Ed is in Texas. You're in the Beltway. So 
you're in the foreign country, not me. Uh, I want to know what you think about Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Will it have any impact at all on the number of followers you have, Edward has, or I have? Look, I, I, I actually don't think there's going to be a huge amount of change. A, a lot of the political debate about Twitter is over uh, censorship, moderation, you know, what, what, what content they're allowing on the site, whether Trump gets back. On, on Twitter, I think maybe the most politically consequential question. But you know, I, I ultimately think you know, whether he, he produces value um, for, for for both Twitter users and and, and and shareholders is you know whether he can he can promote growth, whether he can actually expand the service, and that that is I think a much more um, I'm much more skeptical about that. I, I think uh, you know he's he's shown that he's an exceptional businessman, but. I think a lot of folks are struggling to figure out how to how to make Twitter more successful. If you pander to the right, you, you alienate the left. If you pander to the left, you alienate the right. And you know it is it is geared towards some power users, journalists, media people, political uh, you know operatives and activists. And I don't know how you you know it, 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 I don't know how you grow it and, and make money in, in a way that he really hopes for. So that, that, I think that's why they want to sell sell the Musk at, at a quite high stock price, uh, as it sounds like. Well, Josh, I mean, th this has generated a, an awful lot of um, hand wringing, I would say, in, in among people in journalism, and because it is such an, I mean, really, honestly, most of the value in this is as a headline news service. I mean, that's the way I see this, and a lot of journalists participate in this. Um, I, I am still a little bit mystified, though, why journalists really care whether or not Elon Musk owns this, if it is uh, just a platform for, uh, for, 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 you know, free speech. This shouldn't be really, honestly, I think they would be the least impacted by this, right? Yeah, I mean, look, you, as, a, as, a, as a, one of those power users, like, I, I, you know, I, I have some issues with the types of, of, of content they've chosen to to moderate or regulate, I, I think they've made some some poor decisions. But I, I think the big picture is: is it's going to be a more usable service? Is it going to be a, a more more constructive service? Are you going to have interesting conversations, more healthier conversations uh, online? I think that's ultimately going to be what determines the success of Twitter or not. And you know, like you know, Musk is a very interesting character. He's a successful businessman. He also has tweeted some interesting things. You, you kind of wonder what whether he has what direction he wants to take. Twitter in. I mean, I think, I think despite all the tumult over Twitter, you know, management has actually done a pretty good job in, 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 in you know, the, in, in, in managing the service. Like, it, it, it's a pretty good tool compared to Facebook, in my view, compared to some of these other social media platforms that I think are, are just as toxic. Well, that's more, like, like TikTok. Josh, that's Facebook, like saying so. CNN did a pretty good job except for CNN Plus. And, you know, the, what they did on the Hunter Biden story was such a disaster that it really hurt Twitter for long term. Here's the, the big question for me. If Donald Trump is re reinvited to Twitter, does he go on there or does that hurt Truth Social too much? If, if, if Twitter launches, does Rumble get hurt? Does Getter get hurt? I mean, there are people who are banking on Twitter becoming left leaning and more left leaning who are going to see their investments go down the drain right now, won't they, Josh? If, if Twitter becomes actually what they say it isn't you know fair-minded level playing field all comers those things just go away don't they well i mean truth so I, I, the bigger question i think is what you you lay out here would trump go back on twitter if, if they if they let him get back on on twitter I, I'm, I'm not so sure about that on one hand but on the other hand truth social is not really take, taking off and then neither I, I don't think are a lot of these other other platforms twitter still has sort of the monopoly in the news space. I mean, the bigger problem, Hugh and, and Ed, is that all of the, the CEOs and all the corporate uh, leaders in Silicon Valley have the same political views. And, and it's, it's not just Twitter. It's Facebook. It's TikTok. It's, it's all of these social media platforms. And I think that's the more more serious challenge. I actually think Twitter has fewer problems than some of the other platforms. And um, I guess the risk with Musk is that he could do things that make things even worse or be even more disruptive in a negative sense. But it's always good to, you know, some of it's always safe to go, to stay the course with, with the uncertainty that Musk would, would provide as CEO. But obviously they have challenges. The whole Silicon Valley ecosystem has, has a lot of challenges. They, they think they can create algorithms to, to moderate content, and you need to actually have smart people that understand politics and understand political opinion. And, and you should probably not be you know, regulating what, 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 what the New York Post is writing about Hunter Biden's laptop. You should be as, as light-handed light as possible when, when you can with this stuff. One minute yeah, left, just, Ed. 
Josh, really quickly, do you think that this deal goes through? Uh, looking at what's uh, going on right now, do you think this deal goes through? It, it sounds like it. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, I think, just, just broke that, that, that the talks are ongoing, and we may hear something later today. So uh, this is moving really fast. And, uh, look, Musk is making a good deal. I mean, he's, he's, he's making a good deal, and it sounds like they want to get out when the going's good. That's what I think they're going to do is make their bank and get gone for the hills. Josh Crosh, our hotline Josh on Twitter, soon to be renamed Musker. Uh, and Ed Morrissey, good to have you here. Don't go anywhere, America. I will be back on Wednesday. Kurt Schlichter in for me tomorrow as I roam around Orm, uh, Omaha Beach and the rest of Normandy. I hope you all join us. We'll report back. Radio blogger at my side, Ed Morrissey in Texas. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Harley. Thanks, all of you, for listening. We'll talk to you on Wednesday and tomorrow. Kurt Schlichter.